a good portion of Americans recognize that climate change is a real problem, but they don't internalize it. You know, they recognize it and then they say, okay, well, it's one of 30 things we're going to worry about. I think when we had one party that was conservative to center right and another party that was liberal to, to, to center left, and there were people in each party, some number, that were willing to engage in the give and take of compromise, we had a system that worked. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid conversations with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Bob Rubin. Bob served as the United States Treasury Secretary from 1995 to 1999 under President Bill Clinton. He began his distinguished career in finance at Goldman Sachs and ultimately served as co-chairman. Bob joined the Clinton administration in 1993 as the first director of the White House Economic Council. He is a former member of the Harvard Corporation, one of the founders of the Hamilton Project, an economic policy project housed at the Brookings Institution, co-chair emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, and senior counselor of Centerview Partners. He's the author of An Uncertain World, Top Choices from Wall Street to Washington. And his most recent book, released in May, is The Yellow Pad, Making Better Decisions in an Uncertain World. This is my second podcast episode with Bob. If you'd like to hear more about his upbringing, earlier career, and much else, you can find our first episode linked in the description. Bob, welcome to the podcast. I learned much from you when you were the senior partner at Goldman Sachs, and I always learn something new when we talk. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. But first of all, congratulations on the release of your new book, The Yellow Pad. It's a clear, easy to read, engaging, practical, and insightful guide to how to deal with uncertainty. What motivated you to write the book? Well, about four or so years ago, Hank, maybe a little longer than that ago, actually, I thought to myself, I've seen a lot of life. As you said, I was Goldman Sachs, and I was at the White House and Treasury, and a whole bunch of things since then, and including being chairman of the Council of Foreign Relations and others, and, and my current job and so forth. And I thought to myself, I'd like to reflect on all that, not to look backwards, but to look forward and to write about my views on issues of all kinds, investment, public policy. And then underlying all that, I wanted to write about what I think, at least, is, is the optimal approach to decision making in an uncertain world, which is to have a probabilistic mindset and also a questioning mindset. So you start your book with an anecdote about a particularly important professor you had when you were an undergrad at Harvard. Who was Professor Demos and how did he shape your life and career? We've all had professors that have made or teachers that have made a big difference, but this this guy sounds really impactful to you. You know, it's interesting, Hank. He'd go to the, he would go to the podium in, in you know, the lecture hall, podium, and he would take the wastebasket, turn it upside down, and put his notes on the wastebasket. And that was Raphael Demos. Um, what he basically did was to take us through the great thinkers of the ages. And I can't say that I understand all of, I absolutely did not understand all of that, what they were talking about. Although I did get an A in the course, I might add. But but, the, but after a while, I began to think to myself, he's really trying to do something else. I mean, he obviously wants us to understand these thinkers, but he was also trying to get us to recognize that there are no provable certainties and that everything in life is uncertain. And that, that is the way you need to address everything that you address from that. And that really has shaped my I think it's fair to say it shaped my approach to everything I've ever had to decide that was of any material significance. But I also then took that one step further. And thought to myself, well, if everything is about uncertainty, then all decisions are about probabilities. And as I said a moment ago, Hank, that has shaped everything that I've thought about or been involved in decisions about through everything I've done. Yeah, and, and Bob, and I witnessed this for the time I worked with you on a firsthand basis. So, and this approach, your approach to decision making is at the heart of this book. And you represent this approach with your yellow pad, which is both a literal and a figurative illustration of how to approach probabilistic thinking in real world situations. 
and I have a firsthand uh, knowledge of your yellow pad. I saw you carrying it around. So how does a yellow pad help you make decisions? Well, you're right. It's both literal and figurative, and it's figurative in the sense that we're just talking about it. But literally, what I've done all my life, Hank, you know, I, iPad to some extent now, but even now, very often yellow pads, if I'm looking at a situation, uh, I'll take my yellow pad and I will write out the pluses and the minuses and try to put some odds on them to the extent, you know, it's all, it's all judgment and recognizing that some you can't quantify, but they're still can be very relevant to the decision you have to make and then try to see what is the best decision I can reach probabilistically on a cost benefit basis and recognizing, I said a moment ago, that some of the costs and some of the benefits can't be quantified. So you have to, to deal with them in that, in that respect. And that's what I've done all my life. I'm still doing it. Hank. Yeah, I, I, I've seen it. So I, it's funny. I always used a yellow pad too, but mine was for a to-do list. Oh, I've got that. I've got a for-do to-do list, but it never gets done is the problem. Yeah. This is what I was going to talk about. So I had a to-do list and my tendency, you know, is my, you know, is to rush to make decisions and solve problems. And, you know, I met some healthy resistance and encouragement to slow down when I began working with you. You know, I'd come in and say, this is intuitively obvious to the most casual observer, right? And, <laughs> and then you, you would, you would get me thinking about it. And so, uh, so, so, you know, I, I learned to slow down and, and uh, take more time. But how do you think about timing? when it comes to pulling the trigger on decisions, because you've always been able to pull the trigger too. So I'd like you to talk about how you resolve those two things and reconcile them. Yeah, but to give credit where credit is due, Hank, you were a terrific doer and that is really important. But my, I think you get caught between two different considerations. One of them was something that the senior partner under whom you and I both work, Gus Levy. What yeah. year did you come to Goldman Sachs? I came to, to, to Goldman Sachs in 1974. We were, we lost money in 74 and 75. So I came with a great sense of timing, but uh, <laughs> and if you, you were one of the reasons I came, but anyway, go back to Gus Levy. He was, well, I was gonna say, you and I both worked there when Gus was the senior partner and he was a tyrannical sort of figure, but he's also a man of tremendous effectiveness. And Gus used to say, don't postpone anything until tomorrow because you may not be able to get it done. Do it today. So that's one point of view. Then there's the other point of view, which is sort of mine, which is preserve your optionality as long as you can because that gives you more chance to think about whatever it is you want to do. But as you said, you have to pull the trigger. So I think it's, you have to weigh those two factors against each other. And hopefully what you'll do is, is try to be as thoughtful as possible. But then, as, as you correctly said, and it's a really important point, because I've seen people who are good at preserving optionality, but then they don't pull the trigger. You've also got to pull the trigger. Let me give an ex- Can I give you one example? Absolutely. That's what we need is a good example. Well, here's one that I think makes the point. Somewhere it's around 96 or thereabouts, I could be slightly off, at the Treasury Department, Larry, Tim, uh, Larry Summers, Tim Geithner, myself, several others were in Larry's office. That's the Deputy Secretary's office. And we had the thought about, we, we decided we probably would intervene in the current, in the currency markets as it relates to the yen, which was too weak against the dollar. I mean, at, unnaturally weak, and that was obviously hurting our, our exports and affecting our imports. And the Japanese agreed with us. So about 7 o'clock that evening, we all sat around and we sort of decided to do it. And Tim said, let's go. I said, no, let's not go. We don't have to go until 8 because that's when the markets open in Asia. He said, no, no, you got to do it. I said, nope. I want to continue. I want to think this out one last time because it's a very consequential decision. About 7.30, Tim said to me, well, let's go. I said, we don't have to go, Tim. This is 7.30 and the markets don't open until 8. We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Uh, he got so nervous at about, at about 7.45. They convinced me that with only 15 minutes left to go, maybe it would be good to put out an announcement. And we did. But that, that, that was what you had to weigh. On the one hand, if you don't do something now, you really may not have the opportunity tomorrow. That's a big deal. And on the other hand, if you, if you, if you, if you take optionality and you, you, you sort of wait the thing out a little bit, you might have new considerations. It gives you more time to weigh and balance, go on your yellow pad, make your notes. But as you very rightly said, Hank, you, at some point you've got to pull the trigger. And I've seen plenty of people. Yeah. And you pulled the trigger on some big ones. And when I, I, I think of the Mexican crisis and using the exchange stabilization fund, you know, when the Tessabona was, was, was falling, you know, dramatically and so on. 
So I've watched you make those decisions. So you, you reconcile them both. Now, Bob, we were talking a little bit earlier. You and I have been blessed with the benefit of, you know, support of families, a good education, an opportunity arising from careers spanning relatively benign periods of economic growth and stability. What responsibility do we in society have for those who haven't had the advantages that we have or, or don't have the advantages that we did? That's an issue, Hank, that I've thought a lot about, but not so much in the context of responsibility, though I certainly can understand thinking about it that way. But I think about it a little bit differently. I, I think it is enormously in the interest of our society and our economy. I think, by the way, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's a big moral issue. But I go one step further. And I, I think dealing with the issues of poverty, dealing with those who are disadvantaged, is just an enormous social issue, societal cohesion, et cetera, but also an enormous economic issue. Just think to yourself, if or if if we had dealt with the issue of poverty as we should have long ago, how many people would be in the constructively in the workforce that are not now and how much our social costs would have been reduced? So I, I think it's enormous. Let me give you an example of something, though, and, and the problem. When I was at Treasury, we had a community development department. We set one up. Trent Lott, who I, I thought enormously well of Trent Lott, who was the then majority leader. But Trent called me up to his office. He said, you, you set up a community development office. I said, right, Trent, isn't that terrific? He said, no, you should deal with economic issues like fiscal issues or monetary issues. We don't have to deal with monetary, but that's what he said, monetary issues. And I said to Trent, you know, I, I think this is an immense economic issue. And I think one of the problems we have politically and publicly is people don't see it that way. So I think it's just an enormous issue. But I go to one more point, and that's something you and I were talking about before this started, and that is I think we have all been enormously lucky. Uh, we were born, I'll speak for myself, I was born in this country. I was born in suppose, instead of being many other places in the world it could have been. My parents were very comfortably well off. My father and mother were both highly educated. Uh, we lived in a, in a very nice community. And I think all of that contributed enormously to, to everything I've done. And furthermore, if I look back on the key issues, I'm sorry, hey, the key decisions that I made in my life about myself, I think I was very thoughtful. I, I think I was really very thoughtful. But I think also a lot of good luck. And I'll give you just one little example. I've been at Goldman Sachs about three years, maybe, or yeah, three or four years, I don't remember. And another firm, Whitewell, came and offered me a partnership. And I said to myself, you're not going to be a partner at Goldman Sachs. You're going to leave sooner or later anyway. Well, well, is a well you know, functioning, well established, profitable firm. So I said yes. Well, I went back to, to Gus Levy, and Gus got angry at me, and actually quite uh, vividly expressed his views. But he, he did tell me, if you stay here, you'll be a partner. Now, White Well, interestingly, two years later or thereabouts, was in big trouble, as a lot of the street was, and they sold out to Merrill Lynch at book. I would have had no book, obviously. So my whole life was changed by the fact that that when I came back, Gus reacted in the way he did. So I think that's very lucky on my part. It, you know, it's an interesting thing because when I w was leaving, you know, I went to government at a very early age. And when I was leaving and decided investment banking, you know, I was interviewing firms like White Weld and, <laughs> and Smith Barney, you know, and, you know, but also Solomon and Morgan Stanley, but a whole, a whole number of firms. And as I recall, this is, you know, 1974, the beginning. Goldman Sachs didn't rank at the top anywhere, right? They, they, yeah. they, you, you were, they were a terrific firm, but what? No, you're right, Hank. The most prestigious firms were places like Morgan Stanley, yeah. Lehman Brothers, uh, yeah, whoever, yeah, Hugh Lowe. Yeah, and, and, and so on. So, so in any event, but what, what, what convinced me were the quality of the people, right? So I had this view that almost as important as what you do is who you do it with. And, and, and so that, that was, but that was a, that was, that was a, a fortunate decision. Now, yeah, but you were, you, yeah, but you were more thoughtful than I was because I didn't really, I didn't investigate White Well, which was a very, Obviously, a big over over side on my part, and I just acted. I, yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't preserve my optionality and then explored everything. And that's what I should have done. 
Well, listen, I was more thoughtful. And certain, I was thoughtful to the extent I could be, right? But one of the biggest reasons I went in Goldman Sachs was Jim Gorder, who was in Chicago, told me I would never have to be in New York. <laughs> and you have to be in New York. And, and, and when I went to talk to people in New York, they said, oh, it's a wonderful opportunity in Chicago. It's <laughs> Almond, so, which is what I was looking at. You know, Ira Harris tried to talk me into being in, in, in Chicago. And when I went to see John Goodfriend, the people in New York, they said, you don't want to work in Chicago. That's nothing. <laughs> you want to be in New York. Kara. And so it was just something about the culture. But anyway, getting back to this, you know, the fact that we were, we, we've all been very blessed, very fortunate in our decisions. Yeah, but could I, could I make one more comment, Hank? Yeah. I think, unfortunately, most of the people I know, predominance of people I know, who live in the same world that you and I live in. They may re- they, they recognize the problem of poverty. They probably contribute to something or other, but they haven't internalized either the moral aspects of this or the economic and social societal aspects, and therefore make it a priority for them in terms of pub, uh, supporting politicians, one thing or another. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, and part of it is experience. You know, one of the things that struck me with your book, you write about an experience you had back in 2016. When you gave a talk at the state prison in San Quentin, California. Wow. You know, I read about San Quentin, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't go into San Quentin, right? What was that experience like, and what did you learn from some of the inmates? I, I think, Hank, some of your fellow Republicans thought I should have been in San Quentin permanently. But that's a, another indifferent question. <laughs> um, I got a, a, a note from somebody, and what the note said uh, something it's, it's in the book, and I don't remember the exact words, but something like "How are you, dude?" or something like that. And then he invited me to come to to San Quentin to speak. And I spoke to a few of the people I work with, and I said, "Look, I, my experience is so different than theirs that the things I would talk about just aren't going to be relevant to them." So I said, "I don't think I'm going to do this." And then somebody suggested that we have a conference call, and we had it with the man you mentioned, Shah, and about five or six or seven or something or other other people. And I did it thinking, well, this will determine this. This will show exactly the point I made, which is that what I have to say just isn't relevant to these people. Well, it was just the opposite. They spoke was a long call. Hank, I don't remember how long, but it was a long call. I took pages of notes on my yellow pad and they were remarkably thoughtful about themselves, what they'd done, how they just ruined their lives. And they even they even talked about uh, the kind of decision they, about what they called reactions versus responses. In a sense, reactions are sort of this quick emotional kind of thing. And a response was sort of like my thoughts with respect to probabilistic thinking, which is to say, think about the consequences. So I I thought it was just a remarkable experience. And I, I did go then and, and speak at San Quentin. Well, it, it, it really, I it think. also led me, by the way, Hank, to think a, a, a fair bit about this criminal justice system. And we did two events, at least at the Hamilton Project. And there's just so much we should be doing differently in our society, Hank. Really, really right. When, when you look at uh, uh, so many areas that are ripe for reform. Now, I want to get one other sort of general question about decision making. Because talk a bit, Bob, about how you think about group decision making. How can leaders avoid some of the pitfalls of decisions by committees? You and I have both looked at situations where you've got a lot of bright people trying to be polite and nice to each other on a committee being part of a, d- a decision which is a wrong decision. So how do you think about that? You know, it's, it's interesting what you say, Hank, because you're right. I mean, you at Goldman Sachs and you at Treasury and all else that you've done, you've been surrounded by extremely bright people. I, I think when you have a group meeting, one of the things you have to do, and I had a lot of group meetings, so I'll get to that in one second, but I think one of the things you have to do, say to people is, you know, say what's on your mind. Don't be polite. I mean, you don't want to be impolite unnecessarily, but don't don't let it cause you not to say what's on your mind. I think groups are imperatively important Hank, to get input. In the Asian financial crisis, Larry Summers, Alan Greenspan, myself, Tim, and others, Carolyn Atkinson, and so forth, sat around a, a, a table of David Lipton, who later on had a major role at the IMF, sat around a table and all tried to think about it. And we all made our own contributions, but we couldn't figure it out. And we tried something and it didn't work. So then we had another meeting and finally somebody came up. I don't remember who anymore with an approach that we thought might work, but ultimately somebody had to make a decision. And that was me. And 
There was never any question about making the decision. That was me. Now I'll give you an example of one that didn't work. Somebody for whom I have enormous regard, and you know as well, very well actually, you know, Tom Steyer. Tom ran an enormously successful hedge fund. And then in 19, let's see, 19, no, it wasn't 19, 2008, I'm sorry. In 2007, 2008, in that period, he was very nervous and he wanted to lighten up before the, the crash actually occurred. But his people didn't want to do that. And he told me, you know, I said for morale purposes and other reasons, I'll go along with them. And, of course, the, the crash did occur. And they lost a tremendous amount of money. Since I was an investor, I lost quite a bit, too. Now, on balance, Tom did extremely well. But there was one where instead of just using using the group for input, I think, was terrific. But ultimately, he, he sort of went with an accommodating the group as a decision instead of making his own decision. And that, I think, I, I think is a mistake conceptually, aside from the fact it didn't happen to work out. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I, I just think you get the input from everybody. You hear the debate, the pros and cons, and uh, when, then when a decision's got to be made, you know, the decision maker's got to make it. Now, can I give you one more example? Because just came to mind. Yeah. You, you mentioned before the Mexican financial crisis, uh, Larry Summers and Alan Greenspan both thought we should get engaged. I had just come to Treasury. I was brand new. Yeah. So we sat at a table, and the problem was, it was very complex, and the problem was we couldn't figure out anything to do within the framework of, the, of the, the powers that we had. And then somebody at that table, and I think it was our general counsel, Ed Knight, all of a sudden had an out-of-the-box idea that none of us had thought about. That was the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Now, there were some legal issues there, but we got a letter from the Justice Department, and that's what we did, and that's what they able us to do. Had we not had those meetings and gotten everybody's input, but ultimately somebody had to make a decision, that was me. Yeah, well, I, I borrowed heavily from that, as you know, during the financial crisis. You sure did. <laughs> you come into it even further. Even there was the debate, and people who said, you're talking about $3.5 trillion in money market funds, and you've only got $45 billion in the exchange stabilization fund. How do you do that? <laughs> and I had to say, has anybody got a better idea, right? And, <laughs> and we did it. So, so, so in your book, you make a powerful case for the importance of free expression and unfettered discussion. Now, you're writing this at a time when many Americans feel like they're losing hold of their right to speak their minds in public without fear of being shamed or shunned. This happens everywhere, and it's, you know, in the academic institutions, many cases of this. What threats to free expression do you see uh, today, and how should we address them, Bob? You know, I think it's a very complex question, but I think the overriding principle of unfettered expression and supporting that, in my opinion, should override virtually everything. And I'm using the word virtually, not everything, because I can see where there would be some exceptions. But I think fundamentally in the universe, I, this is something I, the university is something I know a fair bit about because of various other things I do. There's a terrible chilling effect right now because professors are afraid if they say things that people don't react well to, they'll get attacked in social media. I, I have a friend who taught it. He just stepped down, actually. Very senior faculty member at NYU. And he told me that there were faculty members now who wouldn't discuss certain kinds of issues because of the reaction on social media via his students. That's a terror. How are people going to learn to deal with the, the fullness of, re of, of factors relevant to decisions and, and also to learn to deal with the tough issues in our society if we don't have unfettered expression, you know, with some, some, some exceptions at the very end. I mean, you know, if you're inciting violence or something, that's obvious. But actually inciting it, I'm not talking about something that people think but isn't, in fact, an incitement of violence. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it, it then comes down to, at least with academic institutions, comes down to leadership because – You've worked, certain institutions have, have, have been able to do a better job than others. Well, your, your, your University of Chicago did a terrific job with your president. Yeah, yeah. University of Chicago and Mitch Daniels at Purdue, there are a number Mitch of Mitch Daniels, absolutely. A, a number of them, Bob Zimmer. But so now what I'd like to do, Bob. Can we just say one more comment about that? Yeah. You know, I've talked to the presidents of just a, a little number, not many, very small number of institutions, sort of pointing to Chicago. I hadn't thought about Mitch exactly, but, but you're right about Mitch Daniels. And, and the concern they have is they have a student body and they, 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 and I understand how they, what, what they're reacting to, but 
I think it's a terrible factor. Now, I do think it's probably, it, it is it is important to understand the sensitivities that people have based on all of our history. But I don't think, but I think you have to deal with those in the context of an overriding uh, commitment to free expression. And then you make sure that, that you do whatever else you can to help people work through their sensitivities and think about them one thing or another. Oh, it's hard. Let me tell you, being a college president where you've got, you know, D- different uh, constituencies. You've got the faculty, you've got students, you've got the alums, right? And I was talking to the new president of Dartmouth, and she'd written, I think, a very good op-ed about if you're looking for safe spaces, don't come here. We're, we, we, what we're going to have is brave spaces, right? Now, what I do, Bob, is like to apply your decision-making framework to some specific issues. Let's begin with an issue that you and I have worked together on, climate change. So talk a little bit about how you think about climate risks, okay, and and how should policymakers deal with these risks uh, in the most effective way? Well, I'll give you my views, Hank, but the reality is you know a hell of a lot more about it than I do. Uh, I was not originally – I remember when Al Gore, when he was vice president and I was treasury secretary, he was deeply concerned – and I just thought that this was remote and let's not worry about that. Let's worry about what's in front of us. So one day he walked me down from the Oval Office to the vice president's office in the West Wing. He sat down and he said, let me tell you about climate change. And I left there thinking to myself, this guy really knows a lot and he's probably right, but I still think it's way off in time. But as time went on, Hank, and particularly Tom Steyer, who was consumed by it, Tom convinced me that this was a really existential issue. And I, I and now, I mean, I, there's been, I've thought this way for years. I, I think it's an immense threat to life on Earth as we know it. And I think at least, but I don't know what your views are, that we're not going to deal with it politically. And not only in the United States, but, you know, this is a global issue. I, India says, it, or a lot of, the, a lot of the, the emerging market countries say, you all in the develop, industrial world created it. Now you're asking our poor people to bear the burden of solving it. You subsidize us. You pay for that. I have to think they're kind of right. On the other hand, politically, you'll never get that done in, in, in the developed countries. But, but Michael Greenstone, who teaches at the University of Chicago, is a really bright guy, and I know you know well. We had a little meeting the other day, about not the other day, a few weeks ago at the Council of Foreign Relations. And Michael said that the answer, because he, he also thought, by the way, the politics just weren't going to work in time to save the globe. But he said he's very hopeful about technology if we invest enough, because the Delta, he says, between fossil fuels and the other four sources of energy, the renewables, had narrowed a great deal. And if they cross, that is to say, if the renewables become more price efficient than the fossil fuels, then he said that markets will naturally go in that direction. And he at least was optimistic about the potential for that happening if, big if, if there was enough funding for research. Yeah, so I I agree with a, a part of what he says. So I I, I clearly agree with the fact that, uh, that that technology is now moving pretty quickly, and so there are plenty of uh, plenty of solutions in terms of clean energy that are, are are commercially viable right now, and there's others that are coming in that are going to be commercially viable quicker than we thought. Part of that relates to the IRA and what's being done in Europe and and investing all over the world. So I think that's a that's a positive, but I also believe that no matter what we do, the Earth is going to overheat, and based upon the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, there's going to be environmental shocks, weather shocks, superstorms, floods, you know, droughts, fires, that are, are going to impact, you know, the most vulnerable communities, you know, globally and you know, and in every country. The most, and uh, and so I think we're going to need to do a lot in terms of adaptation and resilience and getting ready for these shocks. And I also believe we're going to need some breakthrough technologies to figure out how to get some of the you know some of the the greenhouse gases, carbons that are already in the atmosphere, you know, to, to retrieve those. And, and so this is a tremendous issue. I'm also focused big time on, you know, biodiversity extinction and, 
uh, and we're losing species at a thousand times the, the, the historical rate. And, you know, when you start looking at the rate at which natural capital is being destroyed, science doesn't, it's, it's much more immediate and we don't even know what we don't know there. And so some of the things we're, we're, we're doing to try to solve climate change is, I don't want to get in a big discussion of this, is, is accelerating biodiversity destruction. So we need to do more in both areas. Now, I don't mean to be all doom and gloom because I, I agree with Michael. There's a lot that we're learning and we're moving very quickly now. And listen, you and I wouldn't be working on things like this if we weren't optimists, you know, cautiously optimistic. But, but again, these are serious problems. You know, it's interesting. I, I know a fellow in New York. I don't know him well, but I do know him who has a small company that removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, takes the carbon and then sells it to a, to a very large company. Yeah. And, and he makes money at it. But of course, that's not scale. Right. But Michael, Michael did say, and I, I didn't mention this, that that too was a hope that technology could solve the, the taking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere on both, that, that works both on a scale and a cost basis. Yeah, well, that's what we need to do, right? Because, because there's, there's no doubt that carbon capture and sequestration makes, beginning to make economic sense if you take it out when it's concentrated, when it's coming out of smokestacks and so on. But direct air capture is more, yeah, that's, that's different. It's a bigger problem, but it's one where we gotta make, we gotta make progress on. You know now, where I think all of us have made a mistake though, Hank? Yeah. You know, and that is that, a lot of the people involved with climate change now say that, and I, I think they're probably right about this from what I gather, that most, a good portion of Americans recognize, not, it's a good portion that don't, but a good portion recognize that climate change is a real problem, but they don't internalize it. You know, they recognize it and then they say, okay, well, that's one of 30 things we're going to worry about. I think you and I probably feel it's, it's existentially you know, important. Yeah, we, we tend, most Americans tend to worry about things when they're immediate, right? What, what, what immediate. And, and that's, and, and there's so much that's immediate that's taking their time. But yeah, I, but the problem, Hank, is the, all the things you mentioned, rightly mentioned before, they don't associate, connect with climate change. You know, yeah. you mentioned a whole bunch of things. Yeah, they don't. And which I want to switch to the other thing, which you and I agree on. And, uh, have agreed on for some times. It's, I want to pivot to economic policy. The U.S., you know, faces no shortage of economic risk today. But one issue that we've both focused on is the explosion of the national debt and an unwillingness on our policymakers' part to deal with it in a serious way. So how do you assess America's current fiscal uh, situation and what are, you know, what are the consequences if we don't change our fiscal trajectory? And what can be done to put us on a more sustainable path, right? So how big is the problem? Number one, you know, what can we do to put us on a more sustainable path? Because, you know, and, and then if we don't, you know, what are the consequences? Hank, I think it's an enormous problem. And it too, in a sense, is existential, I think. I don't know if everybody agrees with that, but that's what I think. The CBO, as you well know, about, I don't know, some months ago, I don't remember when, projected that 10 years from now, our, our debt to GDP ratio is about 100 now, 100%, and they project it to be 118%. Serious people I know whose lives are spent, you know, who, who spend their lives working on these things think that the 118 is a gro- is a very substantial understatement that more likely 10 years from now will be 130, 135% of GDP. And I think, you know, you can never tell. Maybe it won't matter. But you sure as hell have to think there's a lot of risk in that in, in multiple ways. Risk to interest rates, risk to inflation. 1992, the business community's confidence was severely shaken by our fiscal situation because they felt not only was the fiscal issue a problem itself, but it sort of represented the inability of our government to deal with our problems. And then when Clinton became president, he said this was going to be the issue that he was going to face, even though he hadn't campaigned on it. Um, and I think we're back to that now. I don't think the business community has that concern right now in the way I just expressed. It. But you go from the 100 percent we are right now and then 10 years from now, 130, 135 percent. And you get on that path. I think that's a very serious risk. And I you know, just a, and I think it, it also is an impediment to public investment, both politically and substantively. And we 
badly need more public investment. The question is what you do about it. And I'd make a couple of comments. Oh, and also, of course, there's always a possibility of a fiscal crisis, which is vastly worse. And I'd make a couple of observations, if I may, Hank. One is that a lot of politicians focus on what is called the non-defense discretionary part of the budget. That's the social programs and base, investing in the basic research like you and I were talking about before and so forth. That is a very, very small part of the budget. That, and the answer doesn't lie there. Those, in my opinion, we're already under-investing, but leaving that issue aside, that that is not where the – the problem over the next 10 years, if you look at this carefully, comes from uh, inadequate tax revenues in 2034 – but don't hold me to that, but it's roughly 2034. The, the Social Security Trust Fund will run out. That doesn't mean people won't get their benefits, but it'll have to come out of the general fund. Uh, that's a very big problem. There, there are ways to deal with it that c- can preserve benefits, but they all involve difficult politics. So, as I say, you can preserve benefits. The federal health care pro- programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and there, you know all this stuff as well, if not better than I do. There, our, our country spends 18% of its GDP on health care. And the average developed country is somewhere around 10%. If we could get a more effective and efficient system, and by the way, there's no difference in outcomes, then that would flow through to Medicare and Medicaid. And finally, there's interest costs going up simply because of everything we just discussed. And I would add two more things. One, I think our national security needs are going to be greater than being projected. And I think what you said is right. Climate change adaptation is going to be a big deal and very expensive. Yeah, and just for, for people that may not be experts, the CBO is the – uh, entity in Congress that, that does the budgeting and makes the projections. But the, uh, yes, I strongly agree with you that you can't solve the problem without dealing with entitlements, which is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And taxes. And, 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 and you, we got to get to taxes in a minute. <laughs> okay. we gotta, we gotta, I think we got to deal with both. Absolutely. And, and in terms of entitlements, there's ways of doing that and it's still protecting those that need them the most. Many ways to deal with it. You know, means testing. I don't need Social Security, right? And so there's ways uh, of dealing with this. And obviously, There are other ways, too, Hank. I mean, you're absolutely right. This is something I've spent a little time on. There are other ways, too, that you could do without affecting benefits of those who need them. Yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, can, you don't have to take the benefits away from those who need them, number one. As you say, we need more tax revenues. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, we can argue whether revenues as a percentage of GDP should be uh, 20% or 22% or whatever they can be, but we need them. But that's and, the debate we should have. But our, yeah. society, our political system seems not to be able to have those kind of debates. In a ser- I totally agree with you in a serious way. And what this has in common with the climate risks is this. You know, the longer we wait, the more painful it's going to be when we go about solving them, right? We're a rich country. So if we move now, we can change the trajectory. But if we hit the wall and we suddenly find we can't sell our treasuries or we're having difficult selling our treasuries at a time when uh, when, when, that we're having big, big budget problems and we need to sell more, and then we're going to have a situation where, you know, the interest rates are going up and it becomes a very serious, painful process. So in any event, it, it, it's, again, something where there's there are good opportunities to do things, but it's having the right political will. Now, Bob, I want to move now to another way, you know, to talk about. Uh, well, I want to. Let's talk about American politics. We can't leave this without saying something. About that's, the ball, that's the ball game, Hank. Right, really right. Yeah, that, that's the ball game. So talk about how you view the state of American politics today. In your book, I think you use a bit of an understatement. It, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's certainly not. It's very accurate. Uh, you write that despite some recent bipartisan accomplishments, the ability to function on a bipartisan basis seems substantially diminished, right? <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's clear. So how can we restore functionality to our political process? What ideas do you have there? Well, first place, I agree with you. I think it was somewhat understated. <laughs> um, I think it's very complicated. Look, let me tell you what I think, and then you'll see where the problem lies, at least yeah. where I think the problem lies. I think when we had one party that was conservative to center right, 
and another party that was liberal to, to, to center left. And there were people in each party, some number, that were willing to engage in the give and take of compromise. We had a system that worked. And I think if we had that structure today, I think we'd be fine. The problem is that uh, in both parties, those with more, I'll call them extreme views, we can call them what you like, but are having a lot of, of having more influence. I do think, and this is not a partisan comment, I think if we had a strong conservative party in our country, I think that would be terrific. I do think this problem is much more lies with the Republican Party because I think that they unfortunately have been, seem to have been captured by the Trump populism. It goes beyond populism. I mean, I don't understand how people can relate to somebody whose principal, principal argument is that the 2020 election was, was false. But anyway, I, I think it's been captured by a group of people who are not committed to governing. But I do think we're problems on the Democratic side, too. But that I don't think is so bad, because basically I still think, and I, that's something I do know a little bit about, I still think basically they function in a reasonably sensible kind of way, although I don't agree with the people that are far out on it. Yeah, well, I, I think maybe populism isn't the right word. Maybe tribalism is the right word, right? But, 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 uh. That's a better word, Hank. Yeah, but, but, but I, but I do think we have a primary system that pushes both Democrats and Republicans to the extreme. And, and so people in the center. So we have a, a strange situation. American people, I think, are at the center. Basically, mm-hmm. you can argue whether it's center left or, or center right or just in the center, but that's where the American people are. But we have a political system that, a, a party system that fo- focuses at people. If you're a, a Democrat in certain, many areas, you're worried about the attack from the left being primary and the Republicans right. on the right. And so that's something that needs to be fixed. Uh, yeah, how do you fix it is the problem, Hank, because the people that you would have to look to legislatively have a vested interest in the, in the, in the current system. It's very hard. It can't be fixed overnight. But I, I think the best way is having a, having a strong leader, okay? A, a strong president emerge. One is prepared to lean against his party from time to time to get things done. But anyway, that's a, a big one. Can I now, have a comment, Hank? I yeah. think the irony is you're right. I mean, I, just as you, as the case with you, I sort of stay involved a little bit with this stuff. Predominantly, the American people do want to get stuff done. Now, they may disagree on what they want to get done, but that you can resolve if you have an atmosphere of give and take. Yeah. But the trouble is the parties are caught because of the primary system and social media in the, exactly the situation you're talking about. So let's talk about something that's easier to control, right? So how do you apply your yellow pad decision-making approach to your day-to-day life? So does it shape your personal investing? <laughs> and then at the end, I'm going to ask you about fishing, right? So <laughs> I'm going to ask you about fishing. Okay. Well, fishing is my primary focus in life in some respects. Uh, fly fishing, that is, not fishing. Fly fishing, as, as, as it is with you. Uh, you know, personal investing, absolutely. Uh, let me tell you, give an example of something. When Trump got elected, you know, on election night, the next day, a friend of mine who was in the financial world and a very, very savvy guy told me, I think this is, he said to me, I think Trump's election is going to be terrible for the stock market. And he sold everything he owned. I said to him, but what, let me ask you a question. You know, what are the odds it'll be terrible? And what are the odds we'll get through this? And, and you know, who the hell knows what's going to happen in the short run? So I didn't do anything. I, I probably should have done a little bit because I did think there was a real risk, but I didn't. So I wasn't probabilistic in the sense that I, but he certainly wasn't probabilistic because he took something that he thought could happen. And treat it as if it was 100% probability. So I, I don't invest in stocks, Hank. I, I invest in funds because I'm not equipped to do stocks. And, uh, you know, I try to be, I try to do what you, you said. I mean, I take my little yellow pad and I, I don't spend a lot of time on it. My son spends some time, but he's busy himself. So he doesn't have much time either. And I just sort of, but I've been around this for 50 years now. So I kind of have some feel for it. And I just make my pluses and minuses and decide what to do, but it's, it's totally probabilistic. Let's end. With, with with some advice for young people. So as they start their careers today, and it's a different world than we started our careers in, right? Maybe. So in an uncertain world, so what's the role for the yellow pad today? If, if I think it's even stronger than it was when, when, when I first started using it, Hank. Right. My view, whatever it's worth, I have grandchildren. I... I think the problems that they face, the uncertainties they face, the uncertainties that the, the complexities of the world that they're entering 
are greater than any time in my adult lifetime, you know, except for individual moments like the, the, the Cuban uh, crisis and maybe the 68 political environment with the conventions and the assassination and so forth. But I think this is the most uncertain time in my adult lifetime. So I think if you're going to make decisions about yourself <laughs> or, or decisions in the context of your working, I think more important than ever, Hank, is to recognize that uncertainty is ubiquitous. Everything is uncertain. And then how do you deal with all that uncertainty? What you don't do, which too many people do do, is they become uh, sort of absolutists and they they become sort of more ideological in a way to deal with. And maybe it makes them comfortable for the moment, but it certainly is not an effective way to deal with uncertainty. So I think it's more important than ever, Hank. And I think that I have a feeling, I hope I'm wrong, that it's not a discipline that a lot of them are equipped to engage in, but I could be wrong about that. Well, I, I got to tell you something. There's some very, very able young people, and I think, Bob, thank you very much. This is. Well, I agree. I agree. There are a lot of very able. I'm, our firm is full of them, and yeah. my grandchild children are also, in my opinion, such. Yeah. But you know, you you talked before about the college campus and is, is, is expression and discussion being fettered and so forth. And I think all that takes you away from recognizing uncertainty and dealing with things probabilistically. That's why your advice is this, why this has been so terrific. So you've given our listeners a practical decision-making framework, which today seems particularly relevant. And I thank you for that. Hank, I've really enjoyed this. I really have. It's, it's fun doing it. And it's always good to see you. Good to see you. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.